And that's where this book comes in. In the pages that follow, the kind-eyed, lovely, and talented Parvati Marcus has compiled many, many stories of Big Maharaji still at work in our human lives. Wild stories, small stories, and everything in between. I believe the accounts have the power to comfort and inspire and hopefully even squash any spiritual FOMO for many generations to come. Because it's true, Maharaji isn't gone, he's just changed. As a friend once told Krishna Das when he was devastated that Maharaji had died, your guru isn't gone, your guru is what's looking out your eyes right now. That's good news. Maharaji isn't done with us, he's still at work or perhaps more accurately, he's still at play. His dance continues in some surprising and unexpected ways. But for more on that, you'll have to read on. Hey everyone, Mind Rolling is back. Mind Rolling on the Be Here Now Network, and I am Raghu Marcus, and today I've got the wonderful wife of my children, Parvati Marcus, who wrote this... Uh, uh, wife this is of your like, children? <laughs> she's a wonderful mother of my children. Okay, everybody... Uh, What's I'm, happened? I, I, I'm going to excuse myself because I yeah. just I got COVID a couple of days ago, so I'm yeah, completely I scrambled, but I, I really wanted to do this, uh, so you'll excuse me. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> Pete Holmes yes. is joining oh. us. Welcome, Pete. I'm already interrupting. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so uh, the wonderful thing related to, and we're talking about a book called Whisper in the Heart, The Ongoing Presence of Neem Karoli Baba, uh, who we call Maharaji, who... Uh, we, Parvati and I, went when Ramdas went back the second time, and others you know, like Krishnadas, uh, met up uh, in India and managed to get the uh, great fortune of meeting such a being. And uh, and then he left in 1973, and that's the expression they use in India. I once asked somebody in a town up in the Himalaya. I knew about a cook that Maharaji had, and I, I I heard he had a wonderful chai shop in this town, Jageshwar. So I went to the hotel I was staying at, and I was friendly with the, the guest house guy. And I said, uh, where so-and-so, uh, his chai shop, uh, I understand he, you know, he moved to uh, Jageshwar. And he said, well, he left. I said, okay, well, when's he coming back? And then he looked at the sky and went, he left. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. So, I love that. Yeah. So Maharaji left uh, in uh, 73 in September. Actually, we're coming right up on the, uh, what, 49th year of it or something? I think so. 70, yeah. Yeah, yeah, next year, yeah. 23, next, right. Yeah. So... Uh, what wow. happened, and when we say, Parvati says, the ongoing presence of Neem Karoli Baba is this book is chock full of stories of people's encounters with Maharaji in all sorts of ways, through Ram Das, Krishna Das, visions, actual physical meetings, on and on and on. So it's a pretty extraordinary book, actually. But what happened is that uh, Pete graciously agreed to do the foreword and uh, it really gives uh, a, a tremendous uh, idea of, of what this book is. So we've asked Pete if he would read it. Yeah, so, wow. I was honored to be asked, honored to be a part, and I'm very happy to read it. Shall I just go for it? Yeah, Party, go for it. You want it. to say anything? You want? <laughs> well, no, I, what happened is I saw Pete at Wisdom in that, you know, this event that we held in L.A. a while back. And I just was so impressed with what he was talking about that I asked him at that point to write it forward yeah. and wrote something up to help him get along. And he came back with something completely different and absolutely wonderful. Mm. Oh, well, I'm glad I asked. I just thought I wasn't fishing for compliments. I'm glad I got one. But uh, I'm just happy to see you. And I thought you could chime in. But that is exactly what happened. Um, that was a really fun event. 
And uh, and thank you, Raghu, for having me on that. Mm. So here we are. I'll I'll, I'll read this. I, you know, I reread it before the Zoom just to sort of refresh oh, really? myself. Oh, really? And I'm really glad I did because b- before we got on this call, I was like, what, what am I doing? I, I don't have any good Maharaji stories. And I'm like, I forgot. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, this is a great Maharaji story. But yeah. it's so funny, like, when you're caught in, you know, I was just with my baby. We took her to breakfast. She's homesick today. And mm. you just kind of get caught up in life. Not in a bad way. We're having a great time. But I... It all that ordinary dayness can push out the memory of something that was so important and impactful to me, and that's why I'm so glad this book exists. I mean, it's it, not only for the people who these stories didn't happen to, but I'm proof also for the people the stories happened to. <laughs> because <laughs> I don't know, the brain—it's a tricky thing to talk about this stuff. It's—it's it's yeah. even more slippery than a like a dream. But I'm glad that we tried and I'm glad that you put them together because reading it uh, before the call, it, it brought me back there. So so I'm happy to read it. Are, are we ready? Here we go. Go. Go for it. Forward. Like 99.999% of the population, I never met Maharaji. In fact, until I was 35, I had never even heard of him. If he had shown me his photo, I would have thought it was Sean Connery or maybe a bald, a bald Tom Selleck. I had no clue as to what an earth-shattering shattering spiritual figure he was. But that all changed when I was a guest on a fellow comedian's podcast, The Duncan Trussell Family Hour. Most comedians are atheists, which makes sense. First of all, atheism looks so cool. It's the cigarette of beliefs. Just leaning on your Dodge Charger, smoking away, scoffing. You think there's a God? Get real. Comedians don't want to belong to any group or belief system. We prefer to be in the back of the room huddled together and making fun of dumb people, dumb enough to sit up front and participate. Duncan, however, is the exception to most rules. Not only is he a hilarious comedian, he also, from what I could tell that day, believed in whatever God crossed his path. Buddha, Krishna, even Christ, the faith I was raised with. I was surprised and delighted when Duncan would go on on and on about his love of Jesus, even if it was after licking three drops of liquid THC off the back of his hand. Still, to use the language of the church I grew up in, he seemed pretty on fire for the Lord. As we chatted about myth, metaphor, symbol, and LSD, I noticed behind his wide-smiling, Jim Henson-looking head, a photo of a bald man in a blanket, in front of which Duncan had left a bunch of bananas. I'd never seen someone leave fruit for a photograph before. Duncan explained that the man wasn't Magnum P.I., but was, in fact, the guru of another man I had never heard of, a man who would go on to change my life, Richard Alpert, a.k.a. Ramdas. Story after story followed of miracles, lessons, and transformations of heart that shook something loose in me. Like Richard Alpert, a heady Harvard professor before his pilgrimage to India, I knew that I, too, needed to move down from my head and into the more gracious and loving space of my heart. The bananas were were never magically disappeared, at least not that I saw, but I knew I had found a new path that might lead me closer to God. The following months, I devoured everything I could find by Ram Dass, his lectures, his videos. I even managed to get my evangelical mind through Be Here Now, which to this day I tell everyone is far too trippy to be people's first introduction to the man. It looks like someone hand-stamped an acid trip, but I managed. I even started going on the retreats to Maui, it was great singing kirtan and eating fried rice in the same room as the now wheelchair-bound Ramdas. But as lovely as it was, I couldn't help but feel something unexpected. Spiritual FOMO. FOMO, for those of you over 50, is fear of missing out. Spiritual FOMO is the feeling you get while watching a YouTube video of hippies and their teacher laughing and crying on a grassy hill in Portugal while you're stuck working the drive through at a coffee bean in Pennsylvania. Or the why not me feeling of meeting people who worked with Mother Teresa or ate brunch with Thich Nhat Hanh. It's a hot, secret, jealous feeling, and it sucks. There I was in Hawaii, supposed to be having a religious experience, and all I could think of was how lucky all these hippies were to have gotten to hang out with Maharaji, the guy. And all I got was white folks with Hindu names (laughs) rehearsing stories of a man who changed their lives, but not mine. It was too much. I felt like I had missed the boat. No matter how many times other people reassured us young folks that big Maharaji, the term they use for the cosmic, bodiless, continuing energy of the deceased deceased guru, 
was still available to change and shape us, I couldn't help but think it sounded like a load of crap. I wanted the real guy, the real feet, the real eye gaze, the real fruit tossed at my real head. Luckily, it turned out they were right. After a few group retreats, I signed up for a private retreat with Ram Dass and learned that Ram Dass, my hero, wasn't just a great speaker, writer, and be here nower. He was also an amazing, an, an amazing welcomer, dare I say conjurer, of the big Maharaji. Over the course of two private retreats and a few casual visits to his house, I experienced Ram Dass's biggest secret talent, welcoming his guru into the room. He appeared to be able to do it on command because Ramdas always saved it for the last of his visits during each retreat. It was, in showbiz terms, his closer, the big finish, the last number, and it was unbelievable. He'd sit quietly, eyes down, just letting the breeze and the birds become the only sounds in the world, and after a moment, this feeling would saturate the room. Each time, I remember it feeling like snuggling into a sleeping bag filled with love or a snowsuit packed with bliss cozy, warm, and close to your skin, as close as the air. It shook, sort of like napping inside a subwoofer, but the gentle vibrations weren't a thumping bass line, but an overwhelming sense that you were a vital part of this, cherished and deeply accepted. After the feeling had arrived, Ramdas would look at me and say, Maharaji is here. Both times, as someone open to unexplainable phenomenon, I glanced around the room just in case there was a translucent Maharaji standing in the corner like Yoda or Obi-Wan at the end of Star Wars. But no, there was nothing to see so much as the feeling of being seen. It was a trip. When I went back to my room, the photos of Maharaji stopped looking like photos of someone else's dead guru and started looking like photos of a beloved family member, someone who might pop by with a casserole at any moment. A year or two later, my brother Ramdas left his bro- left his body. Shortly after, I started telling more and more of the newer devotees my story of visiting with him and feeling the big Maharaji. And just like that, suddenly I was the old hippie at the retreats telling my I was with the guy story, possibly causing a new generation of devotees to have a fresh case of spiritual FOMO. Maybe you can relate. Maybe even reading this right now or hearing this right now, you're feeling left out too, just as I had on my first retreat, just like a lot of us have or still do. And that's where this book comes in. In the pages that follow, the kind-eyed, lovely, and talented Parvati Marcus has compiled many, many stories of Big Maharaji still at work in our human lives. Wild stories, small stories, and everything in between. I believe the accounts have the power to comfort and inspire and hopefully even squash any spiritual FOMO for many generations to come. Because it's true. Maharaji isn't gone. He's just changed. As a friend once told Krishnadas when he was devastated that Maharaji had died, your guru isn't gone. Your guru is what's looking out your eyes right right now. That's good news. Maharaji isn't done with us. He's still at work, or perhaps more accurately, He's still at play. His dance continues in some surprising and unexpected ways. But for more on that, you'll have to read on. There we go. There we go. Wonderful. It's funny, this morning I was on um, Marianne Castano's radio show or something, and I actually told Val's story that's in the book uh, about, about your baby having you know, the UTI and her saying, yeah. Maharaji, this isn't a test, but <laughs> yeah. if you could do something, I'd appreciate it. So what is it with Christianity and testing God? Oh, that's our bread and butter. We love what? that. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it, uh, this is one of the things I had to take issue with this myself, um, is often when things aren't going our way, uh, not only will people test their God, but they'll actually stop believing in God, which I, again, I completely understand that, but there's yeah. something strange about, we're never really talking about this, why your personal experiences really have anything to do with the origins of, of the universe is, is something interesting to consider. Because I feel it myself. There are days when I'm in a fantastic mood and I'm like, Maharaj is everywhere and God's everywhere. And then I'm in a bad mood and I'm like, oh, maybe we're alone. You know, you, you, you have a feeling of doubt. I don't have those 
consciously, but they're in your body somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. And that, that was something I wrote in my own book because it was a big revelation for me was that the the reality, the spiritual reality, the divine reality is not contingent on my mood. But really, that's that's why testing, and that's why Jesus speaks so, he speaks pretty harshly against testing uh, God, the idea mm-hmm. that you would, you know, put, put your God to the test or whatever. He says a faithless generation asks for a sign, these types of things. But here we are uh, still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's a whole section in the book I call Cry for Help, you know, which is where Val's story is. You know, it oh, was a cry yeah. for help. You've got a sick child, you know, Maharaji, I'm here. Um, you know, it would be nice if you did something about it, yeah, you know. Let's... And and so it's like, uh, I don't see the difference between a, a real call for help and testing. Yeah. I th- I don't think it's very honest um, for us uh-huh. to pretend like it's phony holy, right? What Ramdas would say is phony holy to pretend like we don't that we aren't invested in our stories. We are, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 it's, it's crazy to call my daughter having a UTI a story, but it was part of my reality. It was my unfolding drama that day, and we do ask. I had a Maharaji story I didn't use in the book. I don't think. When we got to Maui, this sounds crazy, but the people with young, young babies will understand. Leela was maybe six weeks, seven weeks old. Mm-hmm. And we realized we didn't bring the power adapter to the one thing that made her go to sleep, which was this like rocker thing. Like uh-huh. without without this rocker thing, there was no retreat because there was no You're sleep. Right. There was no care. All we would be doing is taking care of our baby in a hotel room. And I remember praying to Maharaji again. This this kind of is a tricky sp- space for me because you are going like, you know, uh, you you say you love me. Like, uh, can we get some? Can we get something going? You know. But there I was. If I'm being honest, I do that, and I, I might do it later today. Even though, like, theologically, like, where do I stand on that? I don't know, but I do it. And mm-hmm. and the end of that story was I noticed that the cable box in the hotel room was the same adapter i mean it was insane it was the same like obscure not talking about usb i'm saying like it was this weird 1993 radio shack thing and it plugged right in (laughs) and leela went to sleep and we went to kirtan it was incredible it was really 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 fun you know Um, there's there's a great story that addresses this exact thing a good friend of ours who runs the temple hanuman das in taos he went to visit siddhi ma who is who Maharaji left us, thank God, um, uh, our, our Indian mother who died five years ago. And he said she was talking to him and he was talking about some of the problems that he was having. And she said, have you talked to Maharaji about that? And he goes, no, why, why should I talk to him about that? He, he knows everything, you know, it's one of the spiritual bypasses actually in the end. And she said, what are you talking about? It is the duty of a devotee to uh, communicate what it is they need in this life. We are human. And it is the duty of the guru to respond. So, yes, Mm. you need to take that action. I I think about this constantly. You know, Father Greg Boyle, who I'm obsessed with, he wrote Tattoos on the Heart. I I agree. I agree with him. He he talks about when people send around mailers, um, like, you know, email chains that are like, these are the people that stopped and got muffins on the morning of 9-11 and therefore they were late and and they didn't Mm, die. mm -hmm. And he goes, this is proof that God cares. And, you know, this is a heavy question, but he goes, Mm -hmm. so God didn't care about the people or Maharaji didn't care or, or Christ, whatever you want to say, didn't care. And he says, and look, this is a paradox. I believe the UTI story, I believe the cable cord story because that was really important. (laughs) And I believe the story I tell in the book about a dog kind of playfully getting me out of my funk that that felt like Maharaji. I believe in all that. I believe in a God that is invested, that this isn't some sort of mistake, that this isn't some sort of callous test. You know, one of my favorite prayers is the welcoming prayer. And the first line is, welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that happens to me today because I know it's for my healing, right? So I believe in a God that is invested and involved. And at the same time, that 9-11 question, 
uh, Father Greg says, I believe in a God who protects me from nothing, but who sustains me in everything. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that I believe both of those things. They yeah. they cancel each other out, but I believe in both of them fully. And there are Maharaji stories like that where he doesn't save the day. Yeah. Where he decided yeah. the banana story. I was just going to say, yeah. Bring this guy a banana. He's dying. Maharaji blesses the banana and gives it to him. They run it to the guy. They can't wait to save him. He eats the banana. He drops dead. Yeah. But was that man sustained was there did he, was he feeling a love that transcends death we're, we're stuck on this plane going like but he died yeah is there is there right. a bigger right. game going actually on? tuari a kc tuari one of our mentors said to him in an incident like that where the person died and uh, maharaji was joyful he said what are you a butcher or something tuari mm -hmm. who talked to him the way nobody talked to him and he said do you want me to act like all of the people who are caught, I mean, he didn't say it quite like this. I yes, he said, though, the, like the puppets. I was gonna, like the puppets. Yeah. You want me to yeah. act like the puppets. Yeah. And that, so that, you know, that kind yeah. of is a great uh, interpretation of what it is that happens, that it's not, it's to do, it, it's so wrapped up in the karma of each individual. Mm. And, uh, you know, he said, I think in one point, maybe it was somebody else, this person needed to to go now, otherwise he was going to get caught in in a cycle that wouldn't have been good for him. He still had desires or whatever mm, it was. Mm. So we we have no idea, and then it's what trust comes in. And it's our fear of death. It's a basic fear of death that Maharaji doesn't have. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's that we say, well, oh God, he must be a, a butcher if he's letting this person die. But that's because we fear death. Yeah. Right, right, right. And, and that's uh, that blew yeah. my mind when I read "Be Here Now," especially as a you know very much closer to having been an evangelical. Jesus, uh, Ramdas talks about Jesus getting crucified, and I had never heard this before. With looking at the people doing it with compassion, and oh my God, look look how um, look how thick it is. Look at how thick the drama is around them that they think. They have to do this, that there's a Rome, that there's a this, that there's a that and all that. But when Ramdas talks about Christ and death in general, well, he talks about Jesus saying like, this is what you're so hung up about. Look, I'll show you. It's not a big deal. But we're all stuck. This is one of the great things that isn't being discussed is, is we all know we die. And then because we're experiencing time, we sort of weave a story, a, like a, a necessary story to go like, well, we're going to die, but then a long life is better. Like, you know, it, it could be, lifespan could be 10, and then you'd be like, well, he made it to 10. But, you know, lifespan could be 100. Now we're like, oh, he made, at least he made it to 90, or Ramdas made it to 88. These are stories we tell ourselves. And I get it, I do it too, and I'll continue to do it. But there is a comfort in going, there are people that are outside of that, that that realize, as Ramdas said, death is another moment. It's another mm -hmm. moment. It, it happens in this one, if that right. makes any sense. Right. <laughs> There's a number of stories in the book about, um, uh, uh, like Gayatri tells a story about her mother-in-law who was very, very ill, but very scared of dying. And um, she she started doing the chalisa with her mother-in-law at night. And um, they developed a really close thing. Uh, wait, you know, one morning her mother goes, mother-in-law wakes up and says, I had a dream about Maharaji. And, you know, we were in a car and Maharaji was, you know, set, driving and saying, don't worry, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, holding your hand and going, you know, it's okay. We're going to get there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, and, and there's a number of them uh, of him coming, you know, when somebody is dying to help them across. Mm. Or after they died, I remember the kid who right. was who died in a cave, and mm -hmm. he wrote a really. Mm -hmm. like a, you, you both know that story, but he wrote a note. It wasn't like a suicide note, but it was the last thing that he wrote. Right. And of course, again, from our level, we're like, "This is a tragedy." And I'm not. I, I'm saying it is a tragedy. It's like, please don't misunderstand. I'm a human person. This is sad. But when Ramdas tells 
Maharaji about it, he would always be looking at it from a completely different perspective. He would be like, he was one with God. Yeah. He found right. it. So that, that's what Father Greg, sorry to keep mentioning him. He says there are fates worse than death. And the fate worse mm-hmm. than death is not recognizing um, your belonging, your beloved status. Uh, if If it can be melted away and you can mm-hmm. see your participation and your dignity in the in the family of things yeah. that is that's more important and this goes mm-hmm. against western culture than making it to 108 and drinking a 300 bo- year old bottle of wine on a yacht like <laughs> i've i've done stuff like that guys it's some of the it's some of the saddest most you know empty mm-hmm. feeling sometimes you, you go home and you're like oh no i i just had a peak experience I wouldn't trade what I felt with Ramdas right. that day for a million of those. I really wouldn't. Mm. No, there's no peak experience like the spiritual one. Yeah. There's nothing I can think of on the material plane that I comes agree. close to what you feel when you're when you're in the presence of unconditional love. Yeah. yeah. But it can be just yeah. uh, simple things where there's just a moment where you're outside of your normal belief in your story and your thoughts through, I mean, it can be a psychedelic, it can be music, it can be many teachers, many things. Mm-hmm. And once one gets that, that's as much a part of whatever we experience with this being in, in India and following that, it's, there is, it's the ineffable is what we're talking about. So I think that people... Uh, need to know and you know what's involved as well because we were talking about human we're human you know and pete wants to and and val wanted to make sure their child was going to be okay it's it's human to do that it's okay it's It's not a mistake it's not it's not a mistake and so it recalls for me when i was in india in the days after he left meaning years there were some uh, old devotees that were there. I don't know, Parv, if you remember Papaji. Uh, yeah. He was just this wonderful man. He was Sweet a government. Man. Maharaj used to yeah. say he's the only honest politician, uh, government <laughs> official in India. And uh, he had a very large family. And Maharaj used to come stay with him. And he used to tell me he was just part of the family. Somebody had a, a, a fever. He would be inquiring about it. How are they doing? If, if the kid has some problem at school, he would be inquiring about it. He was completely involved in the human condition. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's certainly part of what all this is. Totally. That, I think it, it, it has to be both. Like, so there's the, the chain email thing. But then when I, you look at the life of Christ, he's going around healing people. That's that, you know, I, I get caught in this sometimes too. My feet will be so far off the ground because I'm reading and studying and meditating. And, and I just go, you know, what is everybody so worked up about? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's all just illusion. You know, I have a thing, a wood carving of Ram Dass in my closet that says it's all illusion, no matter how groovy it gets. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's completely true. And also sometimes, and I know Ram Dass, you guys both know this, knows this. I'm the one that forgets. Sometimes you just got to hand out some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, literally, but also, and this is Father Greg's language too, tenderness, compassion, kindness, gentleness, like it matters. And you can change people's lives with a moment of tenderness. Mm. I think that's why Maharaji's instructions to us, which were very minimal, you know, which was love everyone, feed everyone. Which yeah. is serve people. Yes, be tender, be open hearted, be, you know, feed them not only peanut butter and jelly, you know, but also <laughs> whatever yeah. you got in the fridge, you know? Yeah. I mean, and isn't it with the people in my life? Cause, you know, being in the, in this satsang can remind me of church. There's certain people that maybe are, I don't mean to put them down, needier. So you see somebody that's coming up and maybe they're needy, feed them. What are you Hate doing? Them. We have this right. weird human thing where we're like, this is too sweaty. This is too much. It's too loud. And we forget the times that we're the sweaty, loud, mm. needy person. And I'm I'm speaking for myself. I'm the one that's like, yeah. get this weirdo away from me. This is reminding me of church. And they know I have to love them. So they're taking advantage, all this stuff. 
I'm going to quote Father Greg one more time. How can they someone take advantage if you give them your advantage? If you if you're just giving it away, nobody's taking it, and mm-hmm. that's that's right. the PBJ. That's the feed that I think. Well, I always right. feel that it's it's um, honoring the mother. I mean, the whole idea, the old yogic mode, is that you start from the bottom and you go up to God the Father, right? You go mm-hmm. and you merge up like this. But in fact, it, it works this way too. And we come down into the mother, into the earth, into the human humanness mm. of the whole situation. And yeah. that's just, and that's as equally spiritual as anything that happens up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 There, uh, it's interesting in the book, there are stories in particular, I'm thinking of one story by someone I knew. I used to be in the in Kenshi Ashram from time to time. She would be around. She was one of uh, Krishnas's uh, quote-unquote New York posse had been around all his kirtans for a long time. And she was um, had a little bit of a difficult time in terms of, of being around a lot of people and social graces and all that. She just went there for... Uh, getting what she needed from Sidiman Maharaji. Anyhow, I read her story. And and when I read the account, uh, Sarah, it was ex- just, I couldn't believe how far off I was about this person. And the depth of her connection and openness, nothing to do with her personality, which I was, that's how I was relating with her. It was such a telling uh, moving story for me, actually, which mm-hmm. that's a great thing that's in the book. This is okay. I'm going to quote Father Greg one more time. When we despise, okay, you got to you have yeah, to no, give us a I, whole I, thing about Father Greg. I mean, yeah, I you just gotta, read it. it. I oh, just yeah. read it. You would love it. He would be great for the for the retreat too. But um, I'm always trying to sneak those Christians in there because <laughs> 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 I love them. But he says, when when you despise your wounds, you tend to despise the wounded. You know, mm. so it's like. If, mm. if when I see somebody and I go, look how yeah. how desperate this person is, it's because I'm desperate, guys. I'm desperate. Like not mm. all the time, but you have moments where you're desperate, and that's mm. a that's a Jack Cornfield thing where it's like, when you're desperate, I'll take care of you. When I'm desperate, you'll take care of me. That's how it works. Just mm-hmm. like let it get all mixed up and and right. do your part. Don't don't be superior. Anyway, that goes back to the. The satsang thing. But I think... What's uh, Father Greg's last name? Boyle, B-O-Y-L-E. He's the founder of Homeboy Industries, which is the, um, I don't want a (laughs) premiere. It's a wonderful gang rehabilitation uh, center here in Los Angeles. Okay, here you go. Hi, baby. There's my baby girl. Oh, (laughs) you got it. You got to turn me on, Pete. I mean, oh, everything yeah, you know, you've said is so right on. I'm, I'm certainly taken well, by it. And we'll we'll get a, it in the show notes too. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a stand up cry median because he's hilarious, but he makes you cry every time he speaks by telling these stories of mm. an East LA gang member that you're like that. Well, it'd be hard pressed to find someone with less in common than me, and you <laughs> you ta- tell a story. Mm. And you go like, oh, that's my brother. That's my sister. And that's mm-hmm. that's the whole thing. And as much as I love, and I'll drop another name, Rupert Spira, who's a great, you know, Vedanta teacher, the, the oneness, Raghu, that you and I love to talk about. Yeah. Um, I love that stuff. I, I read it every morning. I read it every night. But mm. sometimes it needs to be counterbalanced with someone like, it, it off every day, it needs to be counterbalanced with someone like Maharaji, who's thrown fruit, not, not given big lectures, just giving yeah. out that good love. And that's what that's what Father Greg does as well. Mm. I'm sure it's what Rupert does as well. I just, I like that theology stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else, Parvati, would you uh, like to feature in some way uh, about how this book provides different uh, sustenance, shall we say? Well, it really ranges from those uh, spectacular, you know, appearance stories where suddenly there's Maharaji lying on somebody's doorstep, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. that's the, <laughs> you know. Tell that story. That's an incredible story, though. The French, oh, this is a, a woman in France. Yeah. I mean, who's never heard of Maharaji, Ram Dass, anything, right? Uh, but she goes through a series of events that leave her in basically a suicidal space. She oh, takes yeah. a lot of pills. 
fully dressed. She goes to bed. She uh, doesn't expect to wake up, but she does wake up in the morning. And she looks and she sees that her front door is slightly ajar and she knows that she closed it. So she goes to see what's going on and she opens the door and there's this, quote, tramp (laughs) lying, you know, lying on her doorstep and um, covered by a blanket. Mm. And he looks at her and he says, go sing. So she goes to the computer and turns on, um, she turns on, uh, what is it, uh, YouTube. I mean, she usually listens to classical music on YouTube. But instead of the classical music coming up, what happens is Krishnadas, who she doesn't know, shows up. And there's a big picture of Maharaji behind him. And she looks at the picture and she goes, oh, my God, that's the tramp lying on my doorstep. Wow. And so she she goes back to see who this is. And of course, at that point, he's gone. She goes to give him an orange and he's he's gone. But meanwhile, she has now connected in to this Krishnadas site. And so she learns who the picture is of. She learns, she starts to learn about Maharaji. Her whole life totally changes. And uh, it's an extraordinary experience. You know? Wow. Yeah. See, I love it. I love it. Right. I, and then I, there, you know, there are stories that are just so little, you know, it's, it's like your daughter with a UTI. I mean, yeah, you know, exactly. it's, it's not Maharaji lying on your doorstep, yes. but it's still that connection in. And there's so many stories of people having darshan in their dreams. You know, these are not miracle stories, you know, quote unquote. These are just sudden recognition of feeling the presence. Yeah. yeah, I love that Ramdas used to say, I, I, "I meet with Maharaji in my imagination yeah. or in my mind." And people say, right. "Isn't that just your imagination?" And he's like, "It's like what Joan of Arc said." She, sorry, I'm I'm jumping around, yeah. but they said you talk to God, and she said, "In in my mind, that where else would I talk to him?" Mm-hmm. So it's just like, and Ramdas said the same thing. He was like, "Of course, it's my imagination," <laughs> but like. I love that we use words like imagination, which is really mm-hmm. just like the creative potential of naked consciousness, as if it's a done thing, like an ice cube or, or, or a, a brick. <laughs> you did that in your imagination. What is an imagination? What is mind? I One of the biggest frustrations of my life is that these questions aren't in- interesting to people most of the time, unless they've been mm. primed in some way. Or honestly, if they're on some sort of drag, like that's like a stoner cliche is to go like, how am I hearing my thoughts? How am I visualizing? When I say Ramdas, I see him briefly for a second, translucent in my in front of my eyes. And that's not a miracle because it's just in my mind. Uh, I don't know what's going on here, guys. Where else would I see Maharaji but in my mind? Right. It seems to be the only thing that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you can yeah. unpack that theologically, I suppose, too. Yeah, um, I think we should also mention is we're talking about Maharaji who we met a man in a blanket and interacted with, had had a personality and so on. But uh, behind all of that is uh, that which is uh, just part of whatever name we would want to give it uh, from... Um, the best in India that I've heard is uh, that these rare beings are siddhas, at meaning they are not stuck in any polarity whatsoever. And that means they're part of that which is, whatever God, whatever we want to call it. And that's when you, you mentioned Big Maharaji, how we used to talk about, we do talk about him that way. Uh, that was actually, oh, that great story of Surya da, Lama Surya Das, who when mm-hmm. he came to see Maharaji, they said, well, he's not available right now. He came to Dada Mukherjee's house, but just go sit in front of the um, tucket bed that you know he sits on. So he did, and he had a complete out-of-body experience of the what he called the big Maharaji, that which was beyond a body. And then next thing he knew, they said, okay, he's ready to see you. And he went in and there was the man in the blanket. He was completely uh, flummoxed that he had already met the the real thing and here was the body thing. Mm. And so it's good to remember, this is not 
uh, you know, somebody who, this is not a somebody that, uh, and that's where the whole cult thing is so um, wrong-headed in terms of uh, somebody like this that is merged and just manifesting in, 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 a, in a way through this particular body for 70-odd uh, years. And, geez, we get together and we just did a retreat, by the way, Pete, in uh, M. Parvati in North Carolina, the first time we've gone back east. We oh, you know, did the same thing with Krishna's doing Kirtan and and uh, Sharon was Zoomed in and Bob Thurman was there, you know, it was a spring wash and was just wonderful. And the same thing happens because everyone brings that openness to uh, these retreats. And, it's, it, and Krishna's makes it easier, shall we say, in that, you know, it's the way that he is able to express that, uh, love which we received through kirtan is extraordinary, especially night after night. The first night, people were sitting on their hands, and most it was like eighty percent new people. It was really amazing. And then by the last night, they were all jumping up in their seats and 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 doing that uh, joyous bliss dance thing. Mm. But, well, you know, it's sorry. It's interesting. No. There are stories in the book that uh, you know of people who have had you know, deep relationships with other, you know, beings, whether it's Christ or Mayor Baba or, you know, another one. And then they get confused, like, well, how can I have both Christ and Maharaji? It's like Val's, you know, Mahara, Maharaj Jesus. Maharaj <laughs> yeah. Jesus, that's right. Right. Um, you know, or a Ramananda story, John Welshans, where he's a Mayor Baba devotee, and all of a sudden there's this Maharaji. And how do I reconcile the two? You know, and time and time again in these stories, what you get is that they either have a dream where both of them are seen as being merging into each other, mm. you know, and just being basically the same station, <laughs> mm. you know, or um, that they come to understand that it is just that, quote, space, that space of oneness that these people, you know, can bring you into. <laughs> Yeah, that's why well, I was glad that. Oh, sorry. No, just to say what we all sat down in the first moment. Right. Sub ek, it's all one. There's only Christ, Hanuman, Krishna, whatever. One. So he really, we got drilled right away about the mm -hmm. fact that there is no separation between yeah. any of this. Sub well, that's, Yeah. Sub -ek. The uh, the quote that I was happy to see. Uh, was in the intro. Uh, I didn't read that far through, so that was a surprise to me. <laughs> was the KD <laughs> quote? What do you mean your guru is not your guru is not gone? It's what's looking at your eyes right now. Mm. That was in his um, documentary. That's the only place I found that, but it, uh -huh. which I believe is called Pilgrim Heart or something like that. Yeah, no but one track heart. One track, track heart. heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really and good. that really smoothed it out for me which is mm -hmm. Richard Rohr, who I'm also obsessed with, is a Franciscan. Mm -hmm. He talks about the universal Christ. He talks about Christ not being Jesus's last name. Christ being a word <laughs> for <laughs> what erupted at the Big Bang, the, the allness, the everythingness. So mm -hmm. Maharaji woke up to his Christ nature or was immersed or evaporated or dissolved into his Christ nature. It's the same place. Like if it's all one, it's... It's all one. I even as I'm saying that, there's a part of my there's my belly that goes like, "You're not supposed to say that." I know that's <laughs> tricky because again, and yeah. I say this with love, we are tribal. It's not a nasty word. We we want to know who our guy is. We want to know what our team is. We want to know where the boundary is and the border is. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not like evil. It's just if you really get groovy, you walk into some spaces that your mind is never going to like. It's 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 never going to be fully on board. Your heart will get it right away. My heart completely mm -hmm. understands what Jesus was and what Maharaji was and what Buddha was, uh, what uh, Krishna was. It's all the only thing that you can be. The only, and it's what look it's what's looking at your eyes right now. It's right. not some mysterious thing somewhere else. It's literally filling you with life or Christ right now. And and we can right. awaken to that. But your mind is always. I I sometimes miss it just rooting for 
my baseball team and being like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. got it. And, and these weird hippies yeah. don't. Got yeah. it. This is all great. You know, this is Maharaji once said, I've done everything for you. I leave you the mind. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh, Pete, in that, uh, what you read, uh, there was one phrase that actually, as far as I'm concerned, captures the reality of what we experienced in in physical and then mm. beyond after that body left and what we've experienced all the way through to these retreats that we've been doing and, and the way we have interacted uh, with many people over the years. And you said, in being with Ramdas, you felt completely cherished and deeply accepted, which mm -hmm. was the first moment that I had with Ramdas. Uh, actually, you put it better than whenever I have tried mm -hmm. to characterize it before. Deeply mm -hmm. cherished and, and uh, cherished and deeply accepted. And mm -hmm. that's what it is all about. Yeah. And then, as oh, Ramdas used to say, we radiate that love, which is what we're talking, what you're talking about, yeah, uh, to each other. And it starts with you. I, you know, it's it's funny to, when we use mantra, we expect it to be something in Sanskrit or whatever. But a, a mantra that's been really useful to somebody that again was raised um, by well-meaning people, but gave me a lot of shame and and guilt and fear. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that was their intention, but that's what happened. A mantra that I've been using as I'm falling asleep a lot, if I'm if some of the anxiety of the day, the residue that wasn't cook, cooked off, still kicking up, or I got up to pee, it's 3 a.m., suddenly it starts... You ever feel like your brain is just flipping through TV stations looking for something <laughs> mm -hmm. that is nerve nerve wracking enough to keep you right. awake? I'm like, yeah. why are you doing this? <laughs> and the mantra that I use in those situations which is what we're talking about is I go, God loves me just the way I am. And, and I think that's super powerful. It sounds like something you'd say in Sunday school, but when you've had time to experience or, or become the reality, that reality, mm -hmm. like that story that, that I'm so glad I got to read twice today, that reality and to go back to it and to realize that it's here. That's what's mm -hmm. special about your book, Parvati, is that, it's it's these little reminders. And what we read and what we focus on, I mean, it makes a huge difference. We could just get into the neurology of that. If if I use words like kindness and compassion and forgiveness and grace and mercy, like the three of us and everyone listening, they have the data, are more likely to be forgiving, compassionate, graceful, generous, whatever it may be. And the same goes for talking about nasty behaviors or, or like being rushed or, or productivity or getting to-do lists, all th those sorts of things. You, uh, now I've wound you up in a different way. So starting your day with a book like this or ending your day with a book like this makes mm -hmm. you, it's not just a nice story to read. It cleans up your own signal. And next thing you know, you're getting up to pee at three in the morning and you, <laughs> you're not just saying it. Right. You know, Maharaji loves me just the way I am. Wait, I was... Mm -hmm. I was a little rude to that barista. I'm not saying don't work on that, but Maharaji loves you just the way you are. In the same way that I delight in television mm -hmm. characters that are flawed, that are mm -hmm. that are even evil or wrong, yeah. Yeah. nasty. I'm sitting there just, yeah. oh, he's doing his thing or she's doing their thing, and I'm delighting. I I think the, this big love we're talking about is so open armed that it, it's actually it's actually offensive to us. We would prefer <laughs> that this love would be like, you know, Parvati, maybe maybe you could have had a couple more bonus chapters. Like, we want that. We want that performance principle. But right. but it's already here. It's already yeah. here. It yeah. reminds me of this story, which is partially in the book, which is my story, um, which is that I was smoking beaties in India, those horrible little cigarettes, you know, just a beetle leaf wrapped around this low-grade low tobacco flake. Right. And I was basically doing it to hang out with Raghu, you know. <laughs> I'm going to blame me for that. OK, I'm going to blame you for that. But I really wanted to quit. They were disgusting. You know, <laughs> they, they yeah, really sounds were gross. gross. Um, <laughs> but I always liked smoking and there it was. So one day I come in and we were in Brindavan at, the po at that point. And Maharaji called me over and he looked at me and he goes, stop smoking beaties. And then he goes, I'm the CID of the heart. 
The CID is the Indian version of the CIA. Mm. So (laughs) there I was being very human and smoking beaties and wanting to give him up. But, you know, and he just said, I know what's in your heart. Of course, later I gave away the pack of beaties and he called me over to congratulate me on (laughs) stopping smoking and instant reinforcement, you know. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, that's all the human caring part, you know. But there it was. I'm the CID of the heart. I love that. I haven't heard that. I've actually heard the story of Maharaji asking for the car to be pulled over because he knew someone was jonesing for a cigarette. So, (laughs) but isn't it funny knowing hearts? Yeah. It's not one size fits all. Sometimes the most loving thing, like I don't eat meat. I remember somebody asked um, Mirabai, Mirabai Bush this. They were like, why do we eat meat at this retreat? And I'm kind of, you know, I had a holy rolling moment too where I was like, yeah, why why are we eating there? And she said something that really blew me away. I think about it all the time, especially when I'm eating a cookie or something and cheating from my (laughs) my veganness uh, or, or something else. But she said, you have to remember to some people, it's just a sandwich with friends. Like that's, that's where they're, that's how they see it. You've had this, you've learned this or whatever, and you've changed sometimes. And you were ready to put the beaties down. Do you see what I'm saying? And some yeah. people were ready to stop eating meat and some people that's not, that's not it, but the love is the same. That's what I mean. As a vegan, I would love a little extra love. Look at what I give up. <laughs> I love chicken wing. <laughs> But sorry, dude, it doesn't work that way. (laughs) You didn't get closer by stopping. It's like, are you looking for me? You won't find me in kirtans or eating Mm. nothing but vegetables or winding your legs around your neck. When you really look for me, you'll see that I was sitting in the next seat. Our elbows are already touching, but we don't want that. We want to go on the quest. We don't. We don't want to. Yeah, just yeah. Well, that's the famous Ramdas thing when he said to Maharaji, "Okay, I need a mantra from you," and uh, you know, my bo- and he's thinking, "My Buddhist friends are uh, absolutely getting the most esoteric, wonderful uh, teachings," and he said, "Well, love everybody." And Ramdas was like, well, oh, forget that. I mean, <laughs> I need something." And he said, "Come on, yeah. what about raising Kundalini, feed people." And that that was such a, a valuable teaching yeah. through the years. Hey, before we, I know we got to go, but don't forget, uh, Pete wrote a wonderful book uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Please just mention the book. Oh, thanks, Raghu. It's called Comedy, Sex, God. Those are the three <laughs> topics, but it also sounds like I'm calling myself a comedy sex god. So we just <laughs> own that. And at Raghu, every time I see you, I'm re-grateful. There are huge sections of quotes from Ramdas, but important, not just like random quotes, but this is the thing he said that changed my life. And uh, because of you and sounds true, I was, I got the clearance for those. So it, it mm. means so much. The book would not have been the same if I was like paraphrasing. I needed the man. Himself. Oh, but it's a wonderful book. Yeah, really great. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, really great. So is this. Yeah. And we're going to put it in the, it sh- we're going to put it in the show notes. Everybody will get linked up with that book as well as whisper in the heart and uh, it's all uh, actually available just a couple of days ago um and uh, everything else we're talking about we'll find father greg boyle's book too and put oh that up God. right yeah tattoos on the heart is the first one but mirabai star um who's my dear sister she introduced us and mm. it's just Mm-hmm. Rupert Rupert Spira too, being aware of being aware. If you want to get that, like, maybe you never want to do a psychedelic, but if you want to know what it feels like to like dissolve, uh, yeah. read being aware of being aware. It'll take really? you about two hours, but right. you'll know what it feels like. It's oh. crazy. So, yeah. oh, that's so great. Th- uh, thanks, uh, Pete, for being here and part of course. Uh, appreciate the. Uh, this is the second in a series, and we should probably put the other book, which, book, which is "Love Everyone," which is the stories of those of us that found Ramdas who went to India and what happened, which is also great. And uh, we have a third one coming up, but we'll talk about that later. Yes. <laughs> so uh, thank you again. This is Mind Rolling on Be Here Now Network. Go to beherenownetwork dot com and. Enjoy the plethora of wonderful podcasters, thought leaders, and teachers. And we'll see you next week. Uh-huh.